Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio, and this week I attempt to build my largest ever round table, but what starts with a lot of excitement definitely doesn't end that way. A few months ago, I was up at Gobi Walnut picking a slab up for another commissioned table build I had, and I saw one of the wildest cookies I'd ever seen. And if you don't know the lingo, a cookie is just a cross section of a tree. And this one came from a big, giant, rotted walnut tree. And I don't know why, but I just had to have it. So I paid the, I think it was $1,275 got my other slab, got this slab, and just set it aside because I wasn't even sure exactly what I was gonna do with it. I just thought it would make a really cool table. And eventually what I decided to do was to collaborate with another local maker. So I am working with Sawyer Design on this particular build. He's a really, really talented craftsman, and he's gonna build a custom bent lamb wood base for it, and I am gonna finish the top for it. Then our plan was to put it on eBay, split the profits and just go from there. So this is where we're at. We just have a big, gnarly, nasty cookie and now I have to try to make something out of this. There is a certain camp of woodworker out there that believes it is never acceptable to cut the edge off of a live edge table like this. And some of these people can even border on fanatics. They remind me of those anti-circumcision people outside the hospitals that are protesting. And I can tell you an edge that's cut is gonna be much easier to clean. Some would say more hygienic. And in my experience, women actually prefer it this way as well. When I'd first bought this slab, I'd planned on using the side with more cracks, more voids, more rot as the top of this table. And as I started working with it, I started second guessing myself and thought that I should actually use the other side. But I'm glad that I put it up for an Instagram poll because the results were overwhelmingly for the side with all the cracks and voids and rot. And in the end, I think it was definitely the right choice. And I thank everybody on Instagram that participated because I probably would have made the wrong choice otherwise. And here's one wrong choice I did is I was using a dull jigsaw blade that was extra long and I pushed extra hard. And I was double checking to make sure it was square because I didn't realize I was just pushing way too hard and using a blade that was way too dull. So yeah, not the best circle you will ever see cut on a jigsaw. One of the major problems with this slab was all of these tiny little splits, checks, cracks, every type of defect in there that you can imagine was a part of this slab. And normally I can get in there with an angle grinder, my nylon wheels and clean out the larger cracks like you see there. But this one had so many that I was not gonna be able to reach. And I actually had no idea when I started this project how I was gonna clean those out. As I was posting this on Instagram, just kind of going through the process of, hey, I gotta figure out how to clean this out a guy from Pure Space Dry Ice Blasting reached out and was like, hey, we can clean that up for you. And I'm like, all right, what's that? And what it is, is they shoot these tiny little dry ice pellets that can get into basically any nook and cranny and they evaporate on contact. So unlike sandblasting that can leave a lot of junk around there, this just basically evaporates the second that it hits it. And Traditionally, they use this for like big industrial food safe cleaning. They clean like big stainless vats. They don't do a lot of this live edge cleanup. And I asked him, I was like, so what did this cost if I need to come back and do this? And he's like, oh, well, you know, we can try to take care of you. And I was like, well, what's it cost though? And he said they have a minimum charge of like $1,500 for four hours, which doesn't really make sense for most wood slab cleanup process. And he said that they don't actually want to be in the wood slab cleanup game. He goes, you know what? just putting it out there if some industrial shop happens to see your video it could be good for us so if you are an industrial shop and you want to check out pure space dry ice blasting they were great for me clean my slab up but not probably for your average woodworker i mentioned that this slab is a cookie meaning it's that cross section from the tree which means that the entire piece is essentially end grain and End grain, if you look at it under a microscope, is just like a bunch of straws. It's just ready to soak up anything that touches it. And it can be both good and bad. And for me, it's mostly bad because end grain pieces are extremely prone to staining. And since I love to use black epoxy, that black soaks into that end grain and it could go all the way through the slab and have just these horrible epoxy stains throughout the entire thing. So because of that, I am sealing the entire piece with this liquid glass deep pour epoxy. And I'm end up having to do a couple of coats of this because this thing was so porous by the nature of that end grain that I had to keep basting it with this epoxy until it was completely saturated. I have learned a lot of hard and very expensive lessons working with wood and epoxy over the last several years. And 
I try to share all those hard lessons with you, all the tips and tricks that I've learned, things like being sure to seal your slab before your pour, especially end grain, because if you put black epoxy on it, it will definitely stain. Yes, that's a lesson that took me more than once before I finally figured it out. But the problem with the YouTube format is I have to attempt to keep this video as interesting as I can for a pretty broad audience. And if you're not actually gonna build a table yourself, some of the really important details are gonna be a little bit boring for the general audience. So to counter this, about six months ago, I made my very own virtual epoxy workshop. And it's kind of like a masterclass format and in the virtual workshop, nothing gets left out. It's like three and a half hours long. Absolutely every step broken down into easy to follow chapters. You can go back, rewatch it as many times as you want. I still go through every week and answer every comment or question that my students have. I tell people that it doesn't guarantee you success, but you get to skip the learning curve. You get to skip about the first two years of epoxy table making. And trust me, those first two years are the most expensive and the most frustrating. And I am working with a marketing guy now and he told me that the price is way too cheap. So I wanted to give anybody who's interested a chance to buy it before the price goes up. So there's a link in the video description now. If you're interested, I highly recommend getting it before the price goes up. Now that I had the base to my form built and the slab was extremely well sealed and scuffed up, I was ready to try to slide this giant cookie into the form. And some of you might be wondering what Creed is doing here. That's my old electric stacker. And first off, had a little problem with Creed, tried to use this to get the cookie up, hit the ceiling. So yeah, couldn't use the forklift here. And if you're wondering, this video has been about five months in the making and I have since sold that forklift, bought a kind of vintage antique forklift to replace it. But now I have to figure out how I'm actually gonna get this onto the form because I am not strong enough. It's like 56 inches in diameter and not very light. So I had to stare at it for a while, peek out, see if I could trick a UPS guy into helping me, look at it some more. And eventually I remembered this. I've been using it to hold my firewood, but this is actually a pretty cool little cart. It can lift quite a bit of weight and this cookie was almost too wide for it. But in the end, it was actually like the perfect solution for getting this up on the work surface that I needed. So I've since worked this little cart back into my rotation now that I remember that I have it because I was extremely glad to have it for this exact purpose right here. A conversation that I frequently have to have with potential clients is that building something wide is always about twice as hard as building something long, meaning something that is four foot by four foot is much more difficult to build than something that is eight foot by two foot. And then I always have to tell them that building something round is about twice as hard as building something square. So this big round table is the best of both worlds because it is extremely wide and extremely round and just makes everything more difficult, including building this form. And this is something I came up with a couple of years ago. This is actually a landscape border. It's a composite material, so the epoxy doesn't really stick to it, but it's not as bulletproof as bolting together or nailing together, screwing together a melamine form, which I like to do for my square tables, my rectangle ones. So it always makes for a pretty interesting pour. Since my shop had been so cold all winter, and I guess now technically early spring, but still basically feels like winter, my epoxy is also very cold. So I like to warm it up in that warm water bath and this will do a couple things for me. And one is it will mix much, much easier when it's very, very viscous or non-viscous. I can never remember somebody in the comments, let me know if thin means viscous or not. Anyway, so when it's very thin, it's going to mix very easily. And it's also going to find all those tiny little cracks and crevices, and it's going to fill those up. So I don't have to go back and do those later by hand, because that is such a time consuming process. And you can see how many cracks we have and how helpful it's gonna be if the epoxy can do the hard work, not me. After I had either six or nine gallons of epoxy in there, I came back and found what was not a small leak. Normally I'll get like maybe a little drip here and there, put some flex paste on it and it fixes it no problem. But this was some big seams opening up and this will really get your blood pumping. This is where epoxy table making gets really, really fun. And if you value your floor at all, you should never work with epoxy because I have more epoxy on my floor than concrete at this point. And this was kind of a whack-a-mole game. And luckily for me, kind of got it stopped. You'll see just how bad it got here in a little bit. But now I was at least ready to do that second pour. This took probably about, oh, probably close to 48 hours before it was even gelled up that much. And that's the best way to pour this super clear epoxy. If you're gonna do multiple layers, 
to wait about till the point where it's just kind of that tackiness and then pour that second layer. And here I was making sure to mix my buckets just to make sure that black was a consistent all the way across. This super clear epoxy does an extraordinary job of curing slow enough that all the bubbles that we induce through the mixing process will pop on their own. What it doesn't prevent is air from actually escaping the wood itself. And there is no epoxy that can prevent this. This is a pretty simple fix. I use the torch when it's still just kind of gummy and all the bubbles pop really easily. You can see here, this was a pretty sloppy pour and I want to say this is my worst one ever, but that might not even crack my top five. And I remember when I bought my first house, I was talking to my brother-in-law who's an electrician and back then I didn't know anything about anything. And I was telling him, I was like, hey, do you ever just guess and try to figure something out and somehow along the way it works out? And he just goes, that is all I do every day, all day. And I'm like, oh, that's so, so I'm doing it right. And that's kind of how I feel about this epoxy project. You can see that the form was just shattering off of this. I'm destroying the mold. I'm putting chisels right into the side of this wood. But you know what? We're figuring it out. This, there's no formula for this. There's no plan for this. Everything is just learned on the fly. And in the end, if it looks good, it works. So that's what we're trying to do. Before I started this project, I knew the easiest thing for me to do would be to keep this round table under 48 inches because if it's under 48 inches, I could fit it through the industrial planer and it would just take a matter of minutes. It would be perfectly flat. It would be really fine sanded. Everything would be really, really easy for me. However, it was such a big table, such an awesome piece of wood that I wanted to maximize as much size as I could. And so I wanted to keep it, I believe it's 54 inches is the final size we're going for. And for that, I'm gonna have to go to a CNC. And if you're wondering what kind of client is this for, who ordered this big table like this, this actually isn't even for a client. Nick and I were planning on building this table together, putting it up for auction and just seeing what happens. And before you go bid on this, before you're like, I love blacktail stuff, I definitely wanna own this. I think you might not wanna own this. So if you don't wanna watch this whole video, at least skip to the end because we had a real problem with this build. It is up for auction. There's a link in the video description that said you might not want it. And I highly recommend waiting till the end of the video before you actually place a bid. This part was pretty fun to actually start seeing the slab come to life, see that epoxy surfaced off and realize how cool of a piece of wood this was. And you might've been wondering why that epoxy border didn't come off easy, that landscape border. Cause I've used it a bunch of times. And what I found was I might have left a handful of screws in the side and one of them caused that router bit to blow up. And by blow up, I mean just shatter a bunch of bits, which was only a handful of dollars and they were really nice about it, but I felt pretty bad because that wasn't the only screw we found. I actually left several screws in there. So another lesson learned. You can see that Gobi doesn't do a ton of CNC work because they left me with a lip that I had to cut off myself. And a real CNC shop or the really professional CNC shops have a vacuum bed and they can cut all the way through. If Gobi were to cut all the way through, the thing would have shifted around. So they left it about a 16th of an inch short, which was honestly kind of a hassle. I really didn't know that they weren't gonna be able to cut this all the way through. So I had to cut the rest with the jigsaw then I'll come back later with my flush trim router bit. But for now I had to get started on the touch-ups. And despite the fact that I had overfilled this and really tried to let the epoxy do the work. There are so many of these that that epoxy couldn't creep into that it led to quite the filling process. And if you're wondering what that recess is on the bottom, that is for Nick's table base. So it just fits in there flush underneath and it will leave a really pretty slick look. And here's the top though. They did a nice job with the CNC in terms of the surface but I have so many of these little touch-ups and for this, I'm using the super clear epoxy tabletop epoxy. And you can see there when it's a little cold, it tends to get a little bit thick, which is kind of a pain for mixing. So what I do is I make a little mini hot water bath, let it soak in there for a few minutes and it really thins it out, makes it easier to mix because if you try to mix it when it's cold and thick like that, you basically just whip in an endless amount of bubbles and it comes out almost like a white paste. So thinning it out does help quite a bit. And originally I was just gonna touch up the spots that needed touching up. And then I realized that might actually kind of stain the wood if in the past I've done similar things and it leaves kind of this little leopard pattern where that epoxy just slightly discolors it. 
So I decided to be safe and I would just seal the entire top with that tabletop epoxy. Compared to some of the tools I have, the belt sander can be kind of primitive or a bit of a brute force tool, but it can actually be really useful. And I knocked down the top of this kind of epoxy seal coat and that helped me see all of the little pits that needed filling. And there was a lot, and by a lot, I mean an endless amount. And so I mixed up little bits of black tabletop epoxy and a little paintbrush and I just went to work and this was extraordinarily time consuming. I had about two days of just these endless touch-ups. You'd put a little bit in there and it would soak down below the surface and you'd put a little more in and it would just keep doing that. And as they began to cure, I would scrape and sand them off and I would find more as I was doing that. But it was really just the process of making this as nice as I could. And it was a frustrating process and a time consuming process because I also had to get out those CNC lines. And so having this belt sander, mixing up the direction, keeping it as flat as I could was really the best way for me to do this. I mentioned the belt sander isn't my fanciest tool, but it's extremely versatile. If you're just starting out and you don't have a lot of tools, get yourself a router and you, that way you can make yourself a router sled, flatten your tables and a belt sander to take all those router lines out of it. The belt sander isn't gonna do a great job at finish sanding for that. I do think eventually you'll need an orbital sander, but a belt sander is a great place to start. I just got this new flush trim router bit and it actually costs more than my first router, which was a Bosch router, so it wasn't necessarily cheap. And if you don't know, plan on spending your money on your router bits, not your router. If you're like me, you'll spend money on both because that's like a $700 router I have there and I don't necessarily think that it's worth it. I think it's okay, but definitely plan on investing in your router bits. I won't buy anything that's not carbide. Highly recommend any of the spiral bits and anything with the removable indexable blades. I mentioned that Nick is building a kind of wild bent lamb wood base for this table and I know that I kind of gravitate towards those metal bases in a lot of my videos, but I absolutely love wood bases, so much so that when my wife and I were designing her desk, we chose to do a wood base, and the desk itself is freaking cool. It has these built-in brass switches, built-in brass light. The base on it is like a book match design, which I'd never seen anybody do, and I finally had enough people ask me about it that I decided to have some plans professionally drawn up by an architect, and those are for sale on my website right now. We'll actually be doing kind of a live micro workshop for anybody that purchases those plants. So that will be, I believe on June 9th, all that information will be linked in the video description below, but it's a really cool build. And if you're interested in it, I think you should check it out. This collaborative build process with Nick from Sawyer Design was really fun, but also pretty challenging because we normally work for ourselves. We're not really beholden to anybody. And He's working on a base, he's working on the video, and we're trying to coordinate these things, and he's got sponsors, and it's kind of a whole process and not something that I really anticipated. But one of the things that was really cool is he was able to do some 3D designs, which I can't do, and he actually put it up to a vote to his audience on what kind of edge profile we're gonna do. And in the end, it was nice having the visual, nice having the backup from his audience on what the best edge profile would be. The edge profile I wanted for this table was a 22 degree chamfer, chamfer, bevel, whatever you want to call it. But the biggest bit that I own and actually the biggest bit I could find was this little guy here. And you can see on this thick table, that's not really going to look very good. So I looked everywhere. I couldn't seem to find a bit big enough. And then I finally thought, can I just get one made? And sure enough, there are custom router bit companies and I got this hog made and you can see the difference there. And the reason they don't make bits this big is because they're super dangerous. I'm gonna have to turn the speed all the way down. I'm gonna have to go very, very slow. And it still might blow up my router or this table. So it's gonna be kind of interesting, but let's see how good this brand new router bit does. Generally, the rule is when you're working with large objects is if you can, you bring the tool to the table, not the table to the tool. Meaning that it would probably be easier if I was able to put this router bit in a handheld router and use it that way. Instead, I'm kind of awkwardly sliding it into my router table. And the reason I'm doing it is actually a couple reasons. And the first and probably most important reason is an unproven router bit that could explode at any time spinning at 10,000 RPM around groin level just makes me a little bit nervous. And the other reason is the biggest, most powerful router that I own lives in my router table. This is the three and a quarter horsepower Milwaukee. And 
it's gonna be your best bet at spinning that pig of a router bit. And so I turned the speed all the way down, which is what you wanna do for these big router bits, took some shallow passes, and in the end, it actually worked out okay, and all my appendages made it through one more day. I watch a lot of YouTube, so much so that I get a little nervous when I search something I don't want YouTube to recommend to me. Like a couple weeks ago, I'm searching the best gutter guards for leaves, and while I found what I needed, for the next several weeks, YouTube's like, oh, this guy loves gutter guards. Let's keep showing him gutter guard videos. And that's not exactly my idea of entertainment. And YouTube's kind of my safe space that way, whereas it's not like Facebook where you have to follow your uncle who posts horrible stuff. YouTube, I just follow what I want to follow. And so while I wish everybody watching this would subscribe, it's, it's your safe space too. So what I really only want is if you think I've earned it, if you want to see more content like this, one of the best ways is to tell YouTube, yeah, I like this guy, I subscribed, show me not just his stuff, but other people that do similar stuff. So if you are enjoying this, if you do think that I've earned it, if I've made it in your safe space, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button right now. You can see that I was really enjoying having this oversized outfeed table here for moving around oversized pieces like this that aren't exceptionally heavy, just kind of wide and awkward. And for the edge profile on top of this table, I'm running just my standard eighth inch roundover bit that gives it a nice clean look and it'll be soft on the forearms. And this here is actually kind of a little bit of foreshadowing to how this video ends. And after you see the ending, that might make sense to some of you and might not make sense to some others. I mentioned earlier that I tend to abbreviate sections in these videos that I find to be a little bit slow or boring. And I don't know if there's anything more boring in life than sanding. I would rather watch videos on leaf guards for gutters than videos on sanding just for fun. And so because of that, I really tend to abbreviate these sections of the video. Unfortunately, the sanding is an incredibly important part. So if you do want more information on that, I do have a blog on it. I have another video on it. And there's a ton of information on it in that virtual epoxy workshop as well. So if you want more of that, it won't be in most of these videos because it is just painful to watch and painful for me to create. However, in woodworking, we get to go straight from the very worst part of woodworking to the very best part of woodworking, and that's applying the finish. And it's especially true if you're using like an oil finish or a hard wax finish like I'm using here. You go straight from that painful days of sanding sometimes, right, to finishing the entire top in just a matter of minutes. And it's a really fun part, really rewarding part. And hopefully if you've done a good job on your sanding, which isn't always the case, everything goes well. And so far, everything is going really well. Throughout this build, I've obviously been keeping in touch with Nick, trying to coordinate his base video with my top video and just trying to make things go as smoothly as we can working together. And around this time, I was starting to get a little bit nervous by some of the things he was saying. He was mentioning some of the engineering and a few changes he was making to the table because his base isn't particularly substantial, and this top is definitely substantial. It is thick, it is heavy, it is wide, there's a lot of leverage on it, and his base is really more of a minimalist design when it comes to structure, and so I wasn't exactly sure how it was gonna go, but all I could do at this point was just try to make this top as good as I could, and I knew that he was headed over in just a couple days with the base for the test fitting. You can help you to flip it over. Oh. Good. You nervous? Yep. <laughs> what are, are you? What are you nervous about? <laughs> I'm just, I honestly, it feels good. It feels right. I am confident that this is going to be money. What do you think? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't want to, I don't want to jinx it. I still had a little bit more finishing to do on the top before it was completely done, but we thought we'd get a nice test fit first, just make sure everything was okay. So marked our holes, added the threaded inserts, got everything lined up, got it bolted on, and it had some wobble. But as soon as Uncle Bill comes up and bumps it with his beer belly, um, we've got some jello, and I think I don't like that. This is one-off custom stuff. There is always an issue, and so far there's always been a solution, so we'll figure this out. While Nick was deciding how he wanted to handle the base situation, I still had some more work to do finishing. So I gave a light sanding with a maroon pad on this, added a second coat of Rubio, 
And after I got this on, I went and I set this tabletop in the house for a couple of weeks. And that's gonna factor in here in just a minute and you'll see why. But Nick actually decided to rebuild the base altogether. He wasn't gonna modify that base. He actually made the base, I think it was like 30% larger. He decided to finish it with Rubio so it would match this finish a little bit more closely. He went all out. He worked with an engineer friend of his. He added this giant steel tube to the center. It was an absolute tank. Most of my <laughs> all right, Nick, what's your level of confidence? Last time, 90%. I think that jinxed us. Uh, this one, I'm gonna go with 50%. All right. Nice and safe. We brought the top in from the house where it had been sitting for several weeks, and pretty quickly, I noticed something that shouldn't be there. And if you've seen my past videos, you might've seen that face before. I'll give you a hint, that is not a good look. And what I was feeling was a slight depression and my gut told me I might actually have some trapped moisture there, which was not gonna be a good situation, but we figured while we're here, we should at least test this base before we move on to that potentially trapped moisture problem. And what we found was this base was much, much, much sturdier, but there is some inherent instability to pedestals. So it's not rock solid, but it's definitely usable. So if you're, if you're curious, I am. viewers are curious, should be eight to 11 is like perfect. High would be 15, probably won't be much lower than eight. 12, 11, 11, 12. Ooh. So I got my Wagner Orion moisture meter and I started testing the wood. And what I found is while parts of it were dry, there were pockets all over the slab that had trapped moisture and basically make this slab completely unusable as a table. And this is something I should have checked before I bought this wood. It's a mistake I will never make again. And if you wanna be smarter than me, make sure you get a moisture meter that you check the moisture content of any wood slab before you buy it. Highly recommend this Wagner one if you're looking for recommendations. I really appreciate the opportunity and uh, I'm grateful to be able to work with you on something. Even this, if this, we, is a, this is a really nice way to say that we don't get to sell a table together and because, because the top I made is all jacked up. You know, but we win in friendship. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's, yeah. Uh, that's definitely what I was going for here. I was hoping to get thousands and thousands of friendships from, from, from this build. Yeah, um, I would guess that uh, your mortgage lender um, accepts friendships I, for I, this place. I'm looking at, you know, next few years investing in a warehouse, so friendship would be great yeah. uh, for to get put some friendship down on that warehouse. The uh, interest rates on friendship are very low right now, oh, yeah. as opposed to, so. Uh, but yeah, no, uh, I think I can officially say that this has been, this top has been a failure for me. I think it's sort of weird to get used to failing on, you know, on camera in front of so many people, but oh, you, you get used to it. <laughs> so this is one of the problems with collaborations. I feel like I really let Nick down. I did offer to pay him for the base. He said not to worry about it. He said he has another project in mind for it. Gobi gave me the money back for the slab, which is something. As for this piece itself, I'm just gonna put it up for auction as a wall piece. There are issues with it. I want you to know that. I don't expect it to sell for a bunch, but there is a link in the video description below. Now, every week I like to give a little bit of credit to people who make it all the way to the end of the video. So this week, don't just start your question or comment with the name Sawyer. Go give Sawyer Designs a subscription because maybe if enough of you subscribe, he'll actually do another collab with me.